primary verse a lot of people will look at is verse 4 with the Nephilim in the earth in those days and also after that. That's the little piece that I have a little bit of a contention with some of the other people. Uh, when the sons of God came unto the daughters of men and they bare children to them, the same were the mighty men that were of old, the men of renown. That took place on Mount Hermon uh, in the days of Jared. We get that information from what I refer to as a synchronized, biblically endorsed extra biblical text. Uh, those, a bit of a mouthful, synchronized, biblically endorsed extra biblical text. Uh, those being Enoch, Joshua, and Jubilees, and I refer to them that way because they are synchronized in the sense that they follow the same chronological order of events that we find in the book of Genesis. I call them biblically endorsed because the authors of the uh, Holy Spirit inspired authors of the canonized text are quoting from these books, referencing them by name, or inferring things that can only be found in these books. Uh, so I thought it would be neat to compile them into one volume with the book of Genesis, uh, and that, I have that back there, but in the King James and the Septuagint side by side, because there's some interesting differences between the King James and the Septuagint in particular in the book of Genesis. So you, you get those side by side to read first, and then you get the full volumes of Enoch, Joshua, and Jubilees. Of course, most people who study the subject of the Nephilim derive a lot of information from the book of Enoch just because it's loaded with information about the what they, we find out are 200 watcher class angels that landed on Mount Hermon in the days of Jared. I love putting together timelines. I'm a very visual person, and it helps me to kind of wrap my my mind around various topics if I can put it down visually and try to figure out what's going on. So I love to create timeline charts. And based on the chronologies that were given for the uh, various patriarchs in the Old Testament, we know, you know, these guys were living 900 plus years, right? And they're overlapping and stuff. So I love to, you know, see that visually. If my calculations are correct, and I base this on the works of, uh, of uh, Dr. Ken Johnson, um, Bishop Usher, there's a lot of people who have done timelines uh, specifically related to the pre-flood world with the patriarchs, so uh, as well as my own personal research on it, I came to the conclusion that the Genesis 6 experiment took place in roughly 3550 B.C. So not too long, if you believe creation started at roughly 4,000, some say 3,900-ish. Uh, it's not too long after the creation that we've got this event taking place in the days of Jared. Jared's name means descended. They named him because that's when the angels descended in the days of Jared. So uh, if my calculations are correct, that took place in 3550 BC. One of the reasons why I do not believe in multiple incursions is because I don't think that Genesis 6 even remotely supports it, even in the verse that people use. For instance, especially if you take into the account of the testimony of the book of Enoch, landing in the days of Jared, you end up with the Nephilim were in the earth in those days, what days? The days of Jared. And also after that, what is the that? The days of Jared. When the sons of God came unto the daughters of men in the days of Jared, and they bare children to them, the same, now this is important, the same ones that the author's talking about, the ones who were born in the days of Jared, were the mighty men that were of old. And the Hebrew word there is olam. Olam's translated 136 times as forever and 110 times as everlasting. In other words, very, very long time ago. So the same guys that Moses is talking about were from a very long time ago. They became the men of renown. And the reason I'm focusing on Olam there is because Moses is writing this about 800, 850 years after the flood. He would not have used the word Olam to describe the Nephilim that they just saw in the land of Canaan just recently. The same became the mighty men that were of Olam long, long time ago. When you read in the book of Enoch uh, about the severity of the judgment of the watchers who participated in this experiment, you get to chapter 68 and you see that Michael, the mighty archangel himself, looks at the severity of the judgment that is being imposed on the watchers, and he turns to Raphael, and I'm going to paraphrase, dude, <laughs> wow, no one's ever going to do that again. <laughs> and if you read it for yourself, you know, I'm not going to take the time to read it just for the sake of you know, moving forward here, but it says that uh, he's looking at this, and he says that he's trembling because of the severity of the judgment that he's seeing. And later he says, man, nobody else is going to do this in the bottom verse there. This is, those guys are, are receiving such a severe judgment that for another angel to see that and then commit another incursion, they'd have to be dumb and dumber on acid, in my opinion. <laughs> uh, I mean, that's how severe it was. If Michael, the archangel himself, is like trembling in his boots, that's eh, pretty severe. So I want to talk about what I believe is the, the Genesis 6-4 pre-flood return of the Nephilim. 
when I was synchronizing the texts and looking at them, I'm not going to go through all of this uh, in the red there, but I'm just going to go through the black. This is the Genesis uh, portion of Genesis chapter 6, 1 through 18. We see in the first four verses that angels were mating with women. And that's backed up and synced up with the text that you see there in red. Genesis 6, 5 through 7 shows how God feels about the resulting violence. He's obviously very upset about that. It syncs up with the text that you see there. Genesis 6, 8 through 10 reveals how Noah and his sons were genetically pure. Pastor talked about that in his uh, session earlier. The Hebrew word used there is the same Hebrew word where it says perfect in his generations. Same word that's used to describe the pure red heifer without spot or blemish and things like that. He's genetically pure. So we have an exception there. Noah and his family, and his sons are described next, are the exception to verses 11 and 12 where it says all flesh became corrupted. How much is all? Okay, I think all means all. Pastor, we were just talking about that, right? In Hebrew and Greek too, I think, right? Yeah, all means all all the time. So with the exception of the people that were just described in the previous verses, it says all flesh became corrupted. Syncs up with the text that you see there, and we'll cover that a little bit more in a, in a second here. Genesis 6, 13 through 17, God grows increasingly angry and tells Noah to build the ark and shows him how to do it. Syncs up with the text you see there. Then we have the first mention of the three wives of the three sons of Noah in verse 18. Quick quiz. Does 18 come before or after 12? 18 comes after 12. Okay. Even in public schools, you know 18 comes after 12. How much is all? All means all. Therefore, it seems to me that they would have to fall into the category of all flesh that had become corrupted. And when you read the book of Joshua, it tells you that the three wives were not chosen until seven days before the flood which is the same day Methuselah died. So you basically had a, a funeral and a wedding at the same time. Let's look at Genesis 6, 12 a little more closely here. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. That's about all we get. You know, it's just a tiny little snapshot. But if you look in the synchronized biblical endorsed, actually biblical text, you see in Joshua 4, 18. And their judges and rulers went to the daughters of men and took their wives by force from their husbands according to their choice. And the sons of men in those days took from the cattle of the earth and the beasts of the field and the fowls of the air and taught the mixture of animals of one species with the other in order therewith to provoke the Lord. And God saw the whole earth and it was corrupt for all flesh had corrupted its ways on the earth, all men and all animals. Backed up by another witness in Jubilees 724. I believe where you see the after this in Jubilees right here, I believe the after this of Jubilee 7 is synonymous with the after that of Genesis 6-4. In, Ju- in Jubilee 7, this is a recap. This is after the flood, and Noah is sort of giving a recap of what happened that caused the flood. And he says, and after all these angels mated with women and everything, this is still in a pre-flood context. He says, and after this, they sinned against the beasts and the birds and all that moved and walked on the earth. And much blood was shed on the earth, and every imagination and desire of men imagined vanity and evil continually. This, as I like to say, is as Paul Harvey would say, this is the rest of the story. <laughs> for Genesis 6.12. It's how all flesh became corrupted in a pre-flood context. Now, when I was really first studying this and looking into this, I uh, began to wonder, what is this sin against the animals deal? And of course, I read Joshua 4.18 and Jubilee 7.24 and came to believe that sin against the animals is a reference to genetic manipulation, which created the animal-human hybrids of mythology, which appears to have also made a way for the disembodied spirits of the Nephilim to have host bodies to once again inhabit, thus bringing about their return. What am I talking about here? Well, we have the days of Jared, watchers come down, they mate with women. Enoch tells you that the first generation Nephilim would only live for 500 years and that they were to kill each other off in a massive civil war that their parents had to watch. How many of you have kids? How many of you would like to see your kids massacre each other? Anybody? No, of course not. That'd be very difficult to watch, right? Part of their severe judgment was for them to watch their beloved ones massacre each other. And the text refers to it as their beloved ones. So they loved their children. That was part of their judgment was to watch their children kill each other off. Josephus likens the first generation Nephilim to the titans of Greek mythology. So I believe that this 500-year civil war that Enoch writes about is what the Greeks later stylized and what became known as the Clash of the Titans. You've seen the movie The Clash of the Titans? I believe that's where it all goes back to. I believe it goes back to that story right there. But 1,200 years before the flood is the days of Jared. Okay, days of 3550 BC, 
about 1,200 years before the flood. That's when they arrive. They get busy pretty quick. They start mating with women. They have children. 500 years, they're allowed to live and kill each other off. Then the watchers who gave birth to these children, or, or who made it with women who gave birth to these children, were judged, bound, and buried for 70 generations. And then eventually Enoch is raptured, sometime shortly thereafter. Well, that's 700 years before the flood. All that's over and done with, 700 years before the flood. So that begs the question, what happened? What, why did God get so upset within those 700 years? I believe that's the after that, after this time frame that we're talking about here. And as I was looking at this scenario right here, I happened to read this quote in Dr. Judd Burton's book before I met him. He said, despite the loss of their physical bodies, there is reason to believe that the giant's spirits continued to exist. In this state, they were and are demonic entities. Like other sentient creatures, they have an eternal spirit at their essence. Therefore, the Nephilim and related tribes of giants never really ceased to exist. Only their physicality was lost. And I agree with that 100%. Uh, the book of Enoch tells you point blank that the demons or the wandering or the evil spirits were the disembodied spirits of the Nephilim that were killed. So when you have the clash of the titans, those first generation Nephilim, however many there were, when they were killed off in the Civil War, their spirits went out and became wandering spirits. They lost their physicality. They're looking for bodies again. So what happened next? I believe they started this process of the genetic manipulation that we read about in Joshua 418 and Jubilee 724. They started to create host bodies for their spirits to go into. We learned from Paul that there's one flesh for birds, one for animal, one for humans. You read that uh, quote, I think it's in 1st or 2nd Corinthians, where he's talking about that. Um, when Genesis talks about God breathed into, Adam, his, breathed into Adam's nostrils and he became a living soul, the Hebrew word there is nefesh. It's the same word used for the living creatures when he's making the animals. It is my opinion that God has a God-prescribed nefesh for a bird, for a dog, for a cat, for lizards, fish, and humans. So if that's the case, if that's true, what happens when you blend, let's say, a human with a goat? There's no God-prescribed nefesh for a human goat, for a satyr. So in my opinion, what you end up with is you've created a host body that is fit for a disembodied spirit to go ahead and get into. And those animal-human chimera may have been similar in characteristics to their fathers. Like rep reproduces after like, right? Judd talked about Azazel. Azazel is traditionally associated with the goat. So it is my opinion that the satyrs were later representation or manifestations of host bodies for the like spirit of the Azazel human uh, Nephilim. That, you know, once they were killed off, that goat-like demonic spirit would find a host body that would be uh, appropriate for it. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I've got dinosaurs down there, um, T-Rex and whatnot. It is my opinion that uh, the herbivore class dinosaurs were probably created by God, but perhaps the Velociraptor T-Rex type characters may have been part of that genetic manipulation of existing lizards to create creatures that were, had only evil continual and violence and, you know, that's not a very pleasant creature right there. You see Jurassic Park? <laughs> you know, when they first get there and they see the apatosauruses and stuff out there, wow, that's wonderful, that's beautiful. And then all of a sudden, you know, T-Rex comes through and the Velociraptors. Well, we see in the text that there was violence, you know, terrible violence. So it's my opinion that genetic manipulation took place of lizards there and that all of this took place in the last 120 years leading up to the flood, which is what I believe Genesis 6.3 is really referring to. Genesis 6.3, I think, is overlooked a lot of times where it says that my spirit will no longer dwell with man for he's flesh, you know, and his days should be 120 years. Well, he's flesh since Adam. So what's he talking about there? I believe that he created our bodies as a what? A temple for who? The Holy Spirit, right? He created us in his image and likeness. We are in the image and likeness of God. We are, if, you, if I can use this term, a host body, right, for his spirit to indwell, right? We are the temple of the Holy Ghost. Well, if you corrupt this temple, God says, I ain't going to hang out with you. If you start genetically manipulating your body such that you corrupt the temple that's in my likeness, I'm not going to hang out with you anymore. I believe Genesis 6.3 is the warning. He's sending up a flare saying, hey, all this genetic manipulation you guys are doing, you better knock it off because if you keep it up, I'm not going to be able to dwell with you anymore. And I think, I think that transhumanism that we see today 
is nothing new under the sun. What has been done will be done again. I think that that's what we're seeing take place. And I believe it was taking place in the latter 120 years leading up to the flood. As I was contemplating these things, I happen to have these two books sitting on my desk in, arranged in this order. Doug Hamp's book, Corrupt, Corrupting the Image, on the left, and Tom and Nita Horn's book, Forbidden Gates, on the right. And I looked at that and I thought, wow, what if that's the formula? What if corrupting the image that God created and called good and very good leads to opening forbidden gates that brings about the creation of Nephilim? Uh, everybody likes to use the definition of Nephal, or, uh, from Nephilim, Nephilim comes from Nephal, to, um, to, meaning to fall. But as we see in Strong's 5307, it has a number of other meanings besides just to fall. I think all of them are appropriate. I think when we think of the term to fall, that that's a reference to the, something being corrupted and falling from its original state that God called good. When you corrupt that, it, you've, you've fallen from that state. As I was thinking about that, I happened to go out and see the movie Spider-Man, one, one of the more recent ones that came out, where the main bad guy was the lizard, who was a, a scientist who had, the, had lost his arm, uh, and he was doing experiments. Why is it that you could cut the tail off of a lizard and it grows back? What is the genetic code that allows limb regeneration? So he's experimenting. He cuts off the legs of mice and stuff, starts injecting them with lizard DNA, and eventually he gets a viable subject. The leg grows back. Aha, I've got it figured out, awesome. So he injects his stump with this concoction, and what do you know? His arm grows back. Yay, that's awesome. But he had an unfortunate side effect. <laughs> <laughs> he became a giant lizard creature who had only evil continually in his heart and mind. He started out as a good guy. You see what I'm saying here? I think that's the reason why we had the, the text that, that uh, Pastor Dan read earlier in Genesis, I believe it's 6-5, if I remember right, where it talks about men had only evil continually in their hearts and minds. And I started thinking about that. I mean... There have been a lot of people in history that have been evil people who have done evil things. I mean, the Nazis did some pretty horrific things, right? But I'm sure they still had tender moments with their children and with their spouse, even though they, were, they did terrible things. So I started to think, what is it going to make only evil continually? If, I t if I'm a biblical literalist and take that literally, I believe it was, it was this act of genetic manipulation. where They started doing things, and they had no idea what the, what the byproduct of it would be. And maybe it was progressive. Because I would imagine it was probably seductive to, to do this transhumanist thing. I mean, wouldn't you like to you know, see like an eagle, you know, run like a cheetah, you know, have the radar of a bat or the sonar of a dolphin? Wolverine! I mean, come on. Not if this is the price. Well, but if you didn't know that was the price, you know, the sales pitch is wonderful, but, you know, what happens after 25,000 miles? I mean, you know, <laughs> you know uh, and I believe that carried over into the post-flood return of the Nephilim. And I believe Moses, the same guy who wrote Genesis 6-4, tells us exactly how that happened. Uh, again, I like timelines. This is a larger timeline that I created uh, showing the 350 post-flood years of Noah's life, looking at the text, where did the Nephilim come from? Looking at Genesis 9-18, I'm sorry, but in my opinion, this is a smoking gun that obliterates the multiple incursion idea. It says in Genesis 19 and 18, uh, excuse me, 9, 18 and 19, and the sons of Noah that went forth of the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And oh, by the way, Ham is the father of Canaan. Why did he put that there? He just decided to insert something there. Oh, okay. Oh, and, you know, Ham fathered a lot of people. So why did he just single out? All of a, you know, for what, why did he put that there? This is before the table of nations in Genesis chapter 10. So he just says, oh, by the way, uh, uh, Ham fathered Canaan. Because what Ham did was dead. Well, I... I, I, I'm not going to go there, but I don't think that that's the case. Um, I, and I don't think he did anything with his dad. The nakedness of the father, if you read, uh, I believe it's Leviticus 16 or somewhere thereabouts, it's a phrase, it's a reference to the wife, actually, of, of the husband. In other words, his mother. So it, it appears that he may have done, possibly, there's a lot of speculation on it. Um, well, apart from That's right. Canaan right. Right. Absolutely so right. Whatever the focus becomes that as well as when Abraham eventually is led to the land of Canaan. Correct. So, yeah. Um, and that's that important to point out that the curse was not on Ham. The curse was on Canaan. 
Um, and pretty much everybody who studies the subject of the Nephilim would admit that the Canaanites were Nephilim. That's why we see constant references throughout the Torah and the book of Joshua where God is telling the Israelites to utterly destroy these people, including the women and the children, in some cases even the animals and stuff. Wipe out everything. You know, so we have a choice. Either God is prejudiced and schizophrenic and into random acts of genocide, or he has a legitimate reason for isolating those specific people groups, the Amorites, Jebusites, Girgashites, etc., for utter destruction, including women and children. Because in the standard rules of war, of course, the men go to battle, they fight each other, they kill each other, I get it. But they can also take the women and children and animals as spoils of war. They could take them. Except for the specific campaigns when you went to these certain ites that are listed in Genesis 10, 6 through 20, i.e. the Canaanites. And Moses tells you, oh, and by the way, Ham, not an angel, is the father of the Canaanites. And in case you don't get it, it says in verse 19, these are the three sons of Noah, and of them was the whole earth populated. Overspread in King James, right? Or yeah, overspread. This is about 800 to 850 years after the flood. Moses is saying the entire world was populated by these three people. So if he meant to say, except for that group of giants over there that were fathered by angels, this was the time to do it, but he didn't do that there. And then he goes to chapter 10 and tells you exactly where the ites come from.